Collectivism Munich. My name is Anne Raza, and today I'm joined by Marxist economist and the co-founder of Democracy at Work, Richard Wolf. Richard, this interview will be in English, but let me greet you in German. Wie geht's? Guten Tag. Es geht mir ganz gut und ich hab, ich bin, ich freue mich, dass ich ein bisschen auf Deutsch auch sprechen kann. All right, so let's get back to English. Let us just begin with some fundamental definitions. Uh, what is neoliberalism, what is capitalism, and what is socialism? I wish I could give you nice, short, quick answers. Uh, the problem is I cannot. But the reason I cannot is a very important point in itself. And that is people do not agree with what any of those three terms mean, and they never did. If you were to answer the question, that you pose, this is capitalism, in two or three or four sentences, you might, if you were good at it, capture one of the governing definitions. But you would have excluded others, and in that way, done no service at all to the people listening or watching what we're doing. Uh, so, for example, neoliberalism. The root, obviously, is liberalism. Just to give you one idea, in the United States, basically the word liberal is pretty close to what in Europe we call social democrat. Whereas in Britain, the word liberal has an old history that is actually a kind of laissez-faire uh, attitude in which the government is best that governs least. Etc. Etc. So the very word neo, when you put it there, a new version is already split into those very different meanings, and there are still more. When it comes to capitalism and socialism, uh, let me combine them and give you again a fundamental dichotomy between two different ways of answering that question. So one definition of capitalism that distinguishes it from socialism is the idea that the means of production, this is capitalism now, that the means of production are privately owned and operated, and that the distribution of resources to the producer and the distribution of products to the final consumer are achieved by means of an institution known as the market maybe sometimes called the free market. Okay, so capitalism in this approach is private enterprise, private ownership of the means of production, and markets. And this approach conveniently distinguishes it, capitalism, from socialism as follows. In socialism, the ownership of the means of production has been socialized. That is, it has become the property of the state or of the nation, presumably a democratically controlled nation that in the name of the whole people owns and operates business, enterprise, production. And instead of using the market as a way of distributing resources and distributing products, it uses central planning. The distribution is planned. So capitalism, private enterprise and markets, socialism, public enterprise, and planning. So, I want to... Uh, sorry, well, did you want to continue? Please continue. Yeah, that was a basic definition, a basic distinction that was dominant in the 20th century. Unfortunately, the major societies that tried to build socialist economies on the basis of that definition weren't very successful eventually. The Soviet Union imploded on itself in 1989. Much of the rest of socialist Eastern Europe followed suit. Big changes began to happen in the People's Republic of China, etc., etc. So that definition and that dichotomy began to suffer the criticism that it too may have been part of the problem that afflicted the efforts to organize a new world, a post-capitalist world. 
This led to a great deal of self-examination, self-criticism among socialists, Marxists, and so forth. The end result is, I can give you, and I could give you many if we had time, but I could give you one major change in the definition of both capitalism and socialism. Here we go. That capitalism is not primarily about public versus state or about market versus plan. That, and the reason for this becomes clear in this view. Markets have existed long before we had capitalism. In the American South, which we all call a slave system, there was buying and selling of slaves. There was buying and selling of cotton. There were, in other words, markets do not distinguish capitalism from something else. Likewise, planning exists everywhere. All governments plan, all large corporations plan, all small corporations plan. And they plan because they prefer to use a planning among subdivisions rather than to have those subdivisions buy and sell from each other. In other words, if you understand what a corporation is, it is an effort to substitute planning for markets, ironically. So for this perspective, what is unique about capitalism is not markets and not planning and not private versus state. Let me just drive the point home a little further. Nobody has ever looked at a slave system in which you have masters and slaves throughout the economy and said, wait a minute, if the state becomes a slave owner, so it's not just private citizens, but the state is doing it, well, then it isn't slavery. Nobody ever said that. In other words, that there should be a state that has slaves alongside private citizens that do doesn't affect the definition of such a society as a slave-based economic system. Same thing in feudalism. Were there private feudal lords and serfs? You bet. But did the governments that emerged in feudalism, say the absolute monarchies of France and Britain and Spain, did they have their own serfs? Yes, they did. Nobody has ever suggested that you stop having feudalism when there is a state version of it alongside the private. Only in modern capitalism do you get the bizarre idea that if you have alongside the private capitalist a state capitalist, you somehow don't have capitalism anymore. And that, I think, is a clue that that's a wrong way to go. But here's the positive way, and I'll finish with this. In this definition, what is unique about capitalism are the relations of production, the way people relate to one another in the process of carrying out production, where slavery has master and slave, where feudalism has lord and serf, what capitalism has is employer and employee. The relationship between them is a contract in a way that the lord does not have with the serf and the master does not have with the slave and the wage system and everything that goes with it. Then if you have that in your mind and you understand that capitalism is the employer-employee way of organizing production. You do not care whether that is done by a private person or by a government. Either of them can be an employer hiring and firing employees, which is the norm in most societies today. What then is socialism? Socialism is then the negation of all previous dichotomous relations of production. Socialism is not master-slave, it's not lord-serf, and it is not 
employer employee. Socialism is when the workers, the employees, the people who have been slaves, serfs, or employees, become their own employers. That the employer is simply the collective of employees. And so you've broken the social foundation in which one group of people, always a minority, are the slave, the master, the lord, the employer, and another group of people, always the majority, are slave, serf, or employee. On that basis, the distinction between capitalism and socialism is completely different from the first one I gave you and leads to a different historical understanding and a different strategy for socialists now. I, I want to pick up on the dichotomy between private and public, um, because although you said that uh, it doesn't really matter, uh, it, it, it depends on the method of production and not whether it's in the state hand or the private hand, there is, in my opinion, a small difference. In the private hand, there's a lot of businesses where in the state there's a monopoly. Um, at least the argument is that in the private hands, when it's in the free market, there's more free will. People can choose to buy which products, they can choose to go to um, which company they want, and the market kind of decides it. For example, if, there, if there's one company that's not taking care of health standards um, and it's not in its products, it's not taking into that into account, the consumers will vote it out in favor for somebody who is. So somehow um, there's an evolutionary progress in the market, whereas in the public end, when there's a monopoly on certain products and services, this evolutionary process does not take into force. So what is your uh, counter-argument to this dichotomy? I'm mystified by it. If you don't like what the government is doing, you have a, usually a constitutional right to vote those people out. If you don't like what the employer is doing, you have no such right. You have no voting power. If, if you're a worker in a capitalist system and you don't like what the capitalist is doing to you, here's what you have. You have the freedom to leave that job and go work for another capitalist who will likely treat you exactly in the same way. What kind of freedom is that? Real freedom would mean you have an option to not be an employee, which capitalism works very hard to deny you. So I, I find them different way. Yes, if you don't like a product in capitalism, you can go buy it from a competitor. But that's, of course, only if the producers have not gotten together to make a monopoly. Every phase of capitalism that I have studied in every corner of the world displays an endless process in capitalism in which a quote-unquote competitive situation evolves into an oligopoly or monopoly situation. Built into capitalism is the very collusion among capitalists that makes the illusion that workers or customers can go to a competitor an illusion. Capitalism gives the, in, this is very important, Capitalism prides itself on being a system built in with incentives. I agree. But for every incentive that is going in a positive direction, I will give you the example of an incentive that goes in a negative direction. Capitalism's incentive for competition is woven together with the incentive of the competitors to fight against one another, for the winners of the competition to absorb the losers, buy their machinery, hire their now fired workers, so that many become few who then collude into overcharging the customer and creating no options. This reality makes this notion that the government is a monopolist and the private sector not a fantasy. It's a fantasy of the of the textbook in economics, but not of anything real. So what about the monopoly on violence? We know that 
at least from the argument that I've heard, that businesses cannot just go to consumers or employees with the police um, uh, and exert violence. The government possesses a monopoly of violence. What is your stance on the monopoly of violence? Should the governments have it fundamentally? Or uh, how, how do you see this? Because this is the argument that I hear all the time, that uh, socialists or collectivists use the monopoly of violence to exert um, their market regulation, their laws and their regulations, whereas the free market still leaves a choice uh, to consumers and uh, employees. Yes, well, it, it, here again, the crucial question is, what do you mean by violence? So let's start with the government. Yes, in modern society, as socialists have argued for centuries, the state is best understood as the institution to which a society gives a monopoly of violence. So the question then becomes, why would you give a government the monopoly of violence? And the answer is, that you have a society divided by class, and that the anxiety of the small class, in modern society, that would have to be the capitalist class, the class of employers, they face a fundamental difficulty, namely that they are a minority, and that the majority are the people, if I may use Marxist theory, whom they exploit. Therefore, there is always a danger that the exploited, being the majority, will use that fact to undo, to change, to deprive the minority of its accumulated wealth and power. What is the minority going to do to prevent that? Answer. Make sure that the government, A, is under their control, and B, has a monopoly of means of violence, because that is the final barrier to prevent the exploited majority from using their numerical dominance to change the society. So the existence of a monopoly of power is not some e external event not some existing social problem which the capitalists are passive observers of. They are the creators and sustainers of that decision. Their dominant role in the state is what gathers and keeps a monopoly of violence, which they want and they need, number one. Number two, violence is done in and by private enterprise every day. The forms of it are different from the forms of state violence. I'm going to give you two examples. The first one is in the food industry. Here in the United States now, across the country, most supermarkets have two sets of produce areas, you know, areas where there are fruits and vegetables. One of them is called conventional. The other one is called organic. In Europe, I believe it's called bio, biological, meaning it's organic. The potato that is conventional is cheap. The potato that's organic is expensive. And the same is true across the board. Okay, this means people who don't have money are buying food every day for their children and themselves that has in it chemical fertilizers, chemical pesticides, every, we know many of them are carcinogenic, we know they are not healthy, which is why wealthy people can now go and buy with extra money, which they have, buy vegetables and fruits and meats and dairy that are free of the pesticides and the fertilizer. You understand? Yeah. This is, we, I can show you a dozen studies that indicate the lower your income in the United States, the more often you visit the doctor, the sooner you die 
of that violence. The same it's thing you said about the far, uh, uh, far away industry there, big car manufacturer that being caught with uh, ch cheating on emis emission standards, which has been affecting people. But don't you think there's a fundamental difference between, for example, the state exerting violence with intent? We have seen it, uh, whether it's on the black community in America, and the intention to make profit as a byproduct, you are being, let's say, violent on people. Is there not a difference between intent or do you not see that difference? And you say it doesn't matter what the intention is, it depends uh, on, the, on the effects of it. Yeah, you have to say that because if, otherwise you put yourself in a very difficult logical position. If you ask the government what it is doing, its intention is to maintain order. It's maintain peace. It's maintain civic uh, appropriate behavior in the community. And the unfortunate byproduct of their civil maintenance is violence. Just like uh, the Boeing Corporation will tell you it, it is interested in moving people by air, uh, it's just incidental that they produce airplanes that kill hundreds of people because they, they economize, which there's always an incentive in capitalism to do, to economize on your costs, and then that compromises your safety. So yes, almost all violence is justified by the perpetrator of the violence as being an unfortunate byproduct. The United States is occupying much of the world. It's going to Iraq and Yemen and Syria and Afghanistan. It's always intending to bring democracy. And the violence is an unfortunate side effect of its wonderful focus. If you take that seriously, then you know what you, you should know what you are doing. The, what matters is the question, why are you committing violence? Could there not be other ways of achieving civil community, of safety in the street, uh, proper behavior, other than imposing violence? Which, by the way, is the same question you would address to a capitalist. Is there not a way of creating a food economy that does not kill poor people earlier than it kills rich people? I mean, the answer, it's a question that answers itself. Otherwise, you're not dealing with the violence as you pretend to, as though it were the thing that's upsetting you. Then you if you're going to be upset by violence, then you have got to A, recognize all its forms, and B, question the justifications that are offered for violence, because they're always there. Let, let me get to some other points. What about, what about taxation? So one of the things that's uh, usually argued is that the state or socialism, um, uh, and I'm quoting here, socialism is a way for enforcing theft on people who work hard, who work productive. And um, uh, what do you think about that as, as a concept? Shouldn't, shouldn't we have a voluntarily tax system that, that would take away, if, if we think about it, um, I, would, I don't want to pay that part of the tax where I know that's subsidizing Monsanto. I don't want to pay the tax where I know it's subsidizing Lockheed Martin. Shouldn't we, even as socialists, have a voluntary tax system or at least a tax system where we can think about which part is financing which part of the government? <laughs> yeah, I always like this conversation, the taxes. Why not ask the question this way, which for me as a socialist, I ask. I'm going to tell you a little story to make my point clear. Yeah, go ahead. Ima imagine you have two children, and you have the afternoon with these two children, and you decide to take them to the park. And you're in the park with the children, and there's a man selling ice cream. And so you buy two ice creams because you have two children. But then you do something very strange. You give one of the two children both ice creams, and you give the other two child no ice cream. Very quickly, the following will happen. The child without ice cream will become unhappy. 
he will yell, he will scream, he will act out. You will recognize your mistake and you will go to the child to whom you have given two ice creams, you will take one ice cream away from that child and give it to the child who had no ice cream. You're a good man, you're a good parent, you understand you made a mistake. If you don't understand that, you will have done something dangerous for the relationship between those two children. They may become perpetual enemies. They will, one of them at least will hate you. It's a disaster. When you took the, the second ice cream from the child you gave two ice creams to and took it away from him, you were redistributing wealth. What is it you know as a parent? Don't think of redistributing wealth. Ask yourself the much more important question. Why was the wealth distributed unequally in the first place? We live in capitalist societies that first of all, give 10 ice creams to one person and no ice creams to the other. That's irrational. Then we tear ourselves apart arguing and fighting over the redistribution that always partly undoes the initial <clears throat> unjust, unequal distribution. The answer to all tax systems is we should never have allowed the situation to get to this point. Once It's as if I approach you in the street and I say to you, because you're a libertarian. I'm giving you a complete choice. I will either shoot you, or I will stab you, or I will beat you to death with this stick. Your answer, hopefully, will not be, let me think, what's the best, should I do stabbing? Should... No, your answer is, I don't accept this choice. You're not giving me the choice, I, I refuse to choose among these. The question is outrageous. I'm not free. You're not giving me free choice. You're abusing the term. That's for me. How should we tax? We shouldn't tax. We shouldn't be distributing wealth in the way we have. And this is, the socialist proposal is precisely not to tear ourselves apart about how to redistribute by not creating the need for redistribution in the first place. Whatever differences we give to people, and that's fine with me, those should be democratically worked out. If you spend a lot of time in school and you have a lot of expenses to go to school, maybe there's a good reason you get a higher salary. If you have four children and the next person doing the same work has two children, there ought to be some accommodation here if we make you responsible for raising children, and so on. Let the society decide in a reasonable way. And here's what I guarantee you. No democratic society would very long permit 5% of the people in that business where they are to get millions of dollars while everybody else has trouble paying for their clothing, their housing, their food, their children's education. You would have, right off the bat, a much less unequal distribution and the double benefit society has from that, besides the initial equality, is the freedom from the socially divisive redistribution battles that tear modern societies apart. I mean, you touched upon uh, people earning more. Um, this is what I want to talk to you about. It's productivity. Um, obviously, we are all born in different ways. We've grown up different. We've had different traumas or psychological experiences, which obviously has an effect on the way we work at the workplace. If we put five people for the same task, there will be one person who's faster than the other. That's doesn't socialism kind of equate everybody and shouldn't equate everybody with each other psychologically, even though somebody may be better at something for certain reasons. And therefore, shouldn't socialists 
focus more on equality of opportunity. For example, everybody should get healthcare and education um, and infrastructure, rather than focusing on um, equality of outcome, like making the pay same and stuff like that. So what is your perspective on this? Well, I think you you have to, again, look at, with a little bit of a, a fresh eye on the workplace. Let me explain. I agree with you that everybody has strengths and weaknesses, things they're good at, things they're not good at, things they enjoy doing, things they don't enjoy doing, and so on. That has to be taken into account because, excuse me, because in a workplace, you get better results if people like what they do, feel passionately about doing it well, etc. But you have other demands at the workplace too. Education doesn't stop when you finish school. Education goes on all your life. So, for example, even if what you like is this particular work and what you're passionate about is this particular work, if that's all you do all the time, your education is very different from, it, from a situation in which we rotate you. If you do different tasks, Tasks that include things you're not good at, at least not yet, or you're not passionate about, at least not yet. You may discover, just as you did when you were young, that you've changed and that things you didn't know were exciting to you would become so. Just as you discover that something that was passionately interesting for you when you were 22 has less of a, a, a hold on you when you're 42, etc., etc. So, I also believe in democracy, which means everybody has some kind of quote-unquote equal voice or equal say. But we can't have that work if you're doing the same specific task all the time. For example, if we need some people to have more authority in the workplace than others, we run the risk that they will abuse that authority. So one of the ways we can deal with that is we can make sure that everybody who has authority sometimes is also under the authority of somebody else at other times. It'll make you a more wise, person in authority, it'll make you remember when you're in authority what it was like to be under authority. So I believe in the socialist transformation of the workplace. We rotate every function. We make people play all the different roles because it better equips them to make the right decision for the collectivity. And that would include the right decision on who gets paid more and who gets paid less. That should take into account the individual needs of the worker and whoever is dependent on that worker, the needs of the community of the workers, and the need to take time for education and for other, all of those things, your health conditions, all of them, should be taken into account and that would be then understood by the whole community, validated by the whole community, and there would need to be little or no redistribution because you had had the social values that would govern any redistribution already at work in the initial distribution. So, so for me, that's why I'm not, when people say, my God, you don't want to have a brain surgery done by a person who isn't, a brain surgeon. You know what the truth is? Yeah, I'd like that person to know about brain surgery, but I'd also like them to be a warm and caring human being. I would also like them to take into account my state of mind. I also want them to deal with my spouse who's anxiety ridden about. I don't want a person who has lots of different skills. I don't want some mechanical genius who's learned how to cut my brain. That is not what I need. And so I need that brain surgeon to have been a lot of other things and et cetera, et cetera. But the, the, I, I come from Pakistan and if, if 
I just to give an example about democracy, people over there are highly stressed, highly stressed because there's economic, deep economic problems. We can talk about the roots of it on some other interview. There's a, a, a military conflict. There's so much Wahhabism coming from Saudi Arabia, which is causing extremism. Now, if I was to propose democracy at work, it's obviously there's certain there's certain people that would understand it, but the vast majority, according to my perspective, wouldn't be able to comprehend it because they've not grown up uh, uh, with uh, stress levels, like for example, in Germany, where I am, um, moderate or less stress levels. They've grown up in highly stressed level. They react emotionally. How would, if we would put many of these people at the production place, don't you think, to borrow Plato's argument, uh, it should be the intellectuals making the decision instead of, to borrow play, uh, Plato's argument, the emotional, the, the herd making the decisions. Would that not be co affecting the productivity, productivity of the business, the country, and uh, causing disruptions at the workplace? What is your um, uh, perspective on this argument, which I just borrowed from Plato? <laughs> Uh, again, I, I, it takes a minute because I have to put myself in the frame uh, of the question that, that you pose. Uh, I've been a professor all my life. I am the product of the most elite schools the United States has. I went to Harvard, then I went to Stanford, and then I finished my education at Yale. It is the equivalent, well, you know, you understand what I'm telling you. So I've been surrounded by people who think of themselves as intellectuals, who think of themselves as academics, who think of themselves as existing at the pinnacle of their intellectual life. And I have lived in this society and met lots of other people. I would say in my experience, which is, I mean, I am not Pakistani. I was born and lived all my life in the United States. I would say that the intellectuals I'm surrounded by are more governed by their emotions than any other part of society. The only thing that distinguishes them is that they need to deny what I just said. They need to pretend that that is not the case, that they are some unusual combination in which the brain dominates the heart, in which the analytic dominates the emotional, and they like to attribute to people other than themselves being captured by their emotions, whereas they have risen above that. That is, to use a technical term, bullshit of the worst sort. Uh, and so I, I have a hard time with your question because of the premise, number one. Number two, I'm not, I have no illusions. The transition to an economic system based on democracy at the workplace will take time. And it'll take time precisely for the reasons you say, that people raised in a very different environment by parents whose work life was organized in a completely different way are going to have to go through a period of adjustment. Let me give you parallels. Is it an argument against the end of slavery that ex-slaves will have a hard time adjusting to work in an environment where there's no master? The answer is yes. Will it take time for people who are rural agricultural villagers to find a way to live in, um, in Calcutta or Bombay? Yes, that will take time. The transition from rural to urban always does and has much pain along the way. But it's not an argument for people to stay in the village. And it's not an argument for people to become or to stay as slaves. It is, it is something you do because it moves your society forward without the illusion that suddenly all your problems will disappear and nirvana will have arrived. I don't believe that. I believe that the hierarchical unjust and fundamentally un undemocratic organization of the workplace where a titan in america most work is done in corporations corporation is led by a board of directors has 15 people on it. they make all the decisions 
what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, what to do with the profits that everybody has helped to produce. That is an autocracy. It's an aristocracy. It is the negation. Every day, from 9 in the morning to 5 in the evening, American workers are forced to accept a fundamentally anti-democratic situation. No wonder they don't find democracy an important concept, even when it comes to voting, because it's fraudulent. They're more affected by what happens at the workplace five days a week than what happens in the city or the, the, the government in Washington, which is an, a distant entity barely understood. Their reality, their daily life, is the negation of democracy. For me, moving towards that, making it the explicit goal, making it the target, making the justificational arguments for it, is to move society forward. But I fully understand that there will be problems and difficulties. But I'm very confident that we will have, from the people who are doing it, the leaders emerging who will help make that transition. So you talked about we need time. So isn't that evidence for we need to act more reform, reformistic instead of revolutionary, meaning that maybe something like a basic income should be implemented, which could take down stress levels? and not have people uh, have anxiety problems about filling the fridge. I've heard some statistic that 70% uh, of Americans are thinking, can't even, uh, don't even know if they can pay the bills for the next month. And it's probably even worse in Pakistan. It's not probably, it's worse in Pakistan. Uh, you have daily hunger and daily problems. Wouldn't like something like a re reformistic um, initiative, like a basic income, provide the basis on which then we can have a revolutionary democracy, which you, I think, advocate. What do you think about this? Well, again, I, I hate to be doing this each time, but let me <laughs> problematize your premise and your question. First of all, I don't understand this reform or revolution. I immediately become very suspicious. Here's my suspicion, that when you say that, and I don't mean you personally, but when that is said, the hope is that they can convince you to be comfortable with the reform and to push the revolution into the background. We'll get to that later. The minute I hear that, first I reach into my wallet to make sure it's still there because I have a feeling the next step of this person will be to snatch my money. But you've got uh, to take it to come political realities, you know, I was just thinking along yeah, those lines. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that those are the political reality. I don't think, uh, let me be as stark with you as I can. Without a revolution, no reform is ever secure. Every reform that I could point to, let me give you a concrete example. In the depths of the Great Depression of the 1930s, there was a struggle between people who said they were for reform and people who said they were for revolution. We had a strong Communist Party in the United States. We had a strong uh, Trotskyite Socialist Party, and they pushed for revolution. Okay, they lost. The reformers won. That's why you've heard of Franklin Roosevelt, but you haven't heard of the, of the communists and the socialists. They got reforms. They got social security, unemployment compensation, government jobs, a minimum wage. Wonderful. They got the reforms. As soon as the war was over, the depression was over, and the war was over, 1945, the two major parties, Republican and Democrat, collaborated and cooperated and took away nine-tenths of those reforms. Why? Because they had the power to do so. And how did they get that power? Because in the reforms, they left intact the capitalist corporation, meaning that the board of directors gathered into its hands the profits and used them to undo the reforms that had been forced on them when they were weak because of the capitalist depression of the 1930s. Here's the lesson of American history. It's not reform or revolution. It's that if you want to get a reform that isn't taken away whenever the capitalists have the strength to do so, 
You have to make the revolution. You have to take away from the capitalists their position at the top of this society. They can't be the employers anymore. They can't be the owners of the means of production. Because what they will do if you leave them in that position, we now know they will undo the reforms. The first time this happens, you can chalk it up to having to learn your lesson. We've learned the lesson. To propose to us again that we fight a big struggle here in America or Pakistan or anywhere else for reform, well, in America we have a, a saying, the first time you make a big mistake, shame on the person who did that. The second time you make the same mistake, shame on you. Because then the flaw becomes, you didn't learn your lesson. So yeah, the, the struggle between reform or revolution has been decided. We know that without a revolution, even those reforms we can struggle and achieve are fundamentally insecure. Fundamentally insecure, and we'll leave it uh, here. Richard Wolf, co-founder of Democracy at Work, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to speaking with you again when it next is of interest. And thank you guys for joining us. If you like this content, be sure to hit the subscribe button below and to donate so we can continue to produce independent, non-profit news and analysis. My name is Zan Raza. See you guys next time.